Magnus Carlsen loves to sacrifice pieces, especially if he can get a big attack out of doing so. Some of you may die, but it's a sacrifice I am willing to make. And this game is no different. We're going to see him sacrifice multiple pieces for a huge attack on the enemy king. And if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games or other legendary games from the past, click on the subscribe button down below. It's totally free and you can help us reach our 100 subscriber goal. Now, with all that being said, let's jump right into the game. All right, so in this game, we have Magnum Carlsbad, aka Magnus Carlsen, playing with the white pieces. And with the black pieces, we have a guy by the name of Victor Hansen, who's a decently strong player. He's rated about 2,000. And the game begins with the moves E4 and C6. And this is a Carl Kahn defense. After the moves d4 and d5, the question for Magnus is what does he want to play? You can play the advanced variation by pushing the pawn forward to the e5 square. You can also play the fantasy variation by playing this move f3. In this game, however, we have the move e takes on d5, the exchange variation of the Karo Khan defense. Now, after uh, C takes on D5, we have the move C4, the pan-off attack. And I want to give you a little bit of background about this opening. So, this opening is named after a couple of guys, one by the name of Horatio Caro and the other Marcus Kahn. Now, Horatio Caro was an English chess player. He was born on July 5th, 1862, and died December 15th, 1920. And his biggest claim to fame is that he beat the world champion Emmanuel Lasker in just 14 moves in 1890. It's a spectacular game. I might end up making a video about it um, in the near future. And of course, that game in 1894 was four years before Lasker became world champion, and it was one of his most embarrassing losses. Now, in regards to Marcus Kahn, he was an Austrian. He was born in 1820, died February 3rd, 1886. And, of course, the Karl Kahn is still a very popular opening today. Now, as for the Panoff attack, it's named after this guy, Vasily... Wow, that's a long middle name. Nikolaevich? Uh, I hope that's right. If not, sorry about that. Panoff. And, by the way, for a guy by the name of Vasily, he looks very serious in this photo. In fact, he kind of looks pissed off. Anyways, he lived from November 1st, 1906 and he died on January 13th, 1973. He was a Soviet chess player, author of many chess books, and he was a journalist. And in fact, he won the Moscow City Championship in 1929. And he was a good enough player that FIDE awarded him the International Master title in the inaugural year of these titles being created, both the International Master title as well as the Grand Master title, in the year 1950. So that's just a little bit of background information about this opening. And of course, the idea behind the pan off attack is that you're utilizing your flank pawn to attack the center of the board. Now, in order to defend that, uh, we now have the move knight to f6, just simply defending it, both with the knight and the queen. And now Magnus plays the move knight to c3, adding an additional attacker to this centralized pawn. And after the move e6, we have a position that looks very similar to the queen's gambit declined. Uh, but notice that in this position, we don't have an E pawn for Magnus, and we don't have a C pawn for Victor. And just to give you an idea of the Queen's Gambit decline, just going back over here, you would have like the moves D4, D5, C4, E6, Knight C3, Knight F6. And that would be the Queen's Gambit decline. And as you can see, it looks very, very familiar to this position over here, except we don't have those pawns. And that is a big difference. From here, Magnus continues his development with the move Knight to F3, just simply developing his Knight, protecting this centralized pawn now with both his Knight and his Queen. Here, Victor Hansen decides that he wants to develop his Bishop out to the B4 square, pinning this Knight to the King. The Knight can no longer move. It's no longer attacking this centralized pawn. And as you can see, there's still a lot of tension between these pawns, and it's important that that tension remains there, so that way there's additional complications within the position. If suddenly you were to take this pawn or take this pawn, then the position becomes a little too simple, and then you have less chances of winning. And after Magnus plays the move bishop to d3, Victor realizes that he can win some tempo on the bishop by playing the move d takes on c4. Now, as you can see, the pawn now targets this bishop, and this gives him a little bit of extra time because now you have to move the bishop, which you already just moved. So we have the bishop taking on the c4 square, and you've won a little bit of tempo. Now we have the move castles from both players. We have castles from Victor, castles from Magnus, and now this move b6. And the idea behind b6 is that uh, Victor wants to fianchetto his bishop onto the long diagonal where it will put some pressure 
onto this knight. Magnus now develops his second bishop out to the g5 square, also delivering a pin onto the queen. And now that uh, Magnus' king is out of the center of the board, there's no longer a pin on this knight, and it can move freely about the cabin. Victor now continues his idea of fianchettoing the bishop to the long diagonal by playing the move bishop to b7. As you can see, it now takes control of this long diagonal, and it will be able to potentially take that knight in the future, damaging the pawn structure. Magnus now plays the move bishop to b3. Now, this is not the greatest move in the world because now Victor can take this knight, getting rid of it and doubling the pawns on the f-file, which would open up Magnus's king for a potential attack. Here we don't see that, though. We have the move bishop to e7 retreating. Uh, he doesn't want to lose his bishop, and so he goes and defends the knight and breaks the pin on the knight to the queen. Magnus now plays the move knight to e5. And knight to e5 has a very nasty idea behind it. And it has everything to do with this battery. This bishop and the queen line down onto this e6 square, which currently is being defended only by this pawn. So if you can get rid of that pawn, then the e6 pawn will no longer be defended. So after the move knight f to d7, trying to go and get rid of this knight, that's the whole idea is you're trying to get rid of this knight, and potentially get rid of the bishop, Magnus now plays a brilliant move. And it may not be the most brilliant move for Magnus, but I think for most people this is a pretty, pretty brilliant move. And that is the move knight takes on f7. And of course you are attacking the queen, so you have to respond. You cannot just leave it there. And by, uh, by taking that pawn, the pawn on the e6 square is no longer defended. So Victor now takes with the rook on the f7 square and Magnus is now able to collect the pawn on the e6 square with his bishop. And after bishop takes on g5, Magnus now takes the rook with a check. And after Victor moves his king out of the way to the h8 square, uh, Magnus can just back the bishop up to the d7 square and he is up a pawn and he has the rook for the bishop and the knight. So Magnus is doing very well in this position. And as you can see, the evaluation bar gives it a plus 0.7 advantage for Magnus. Now, noticing in this position that his bishop is completely hanging and he's lacking in development, uh, Victor now plays the move knight to c6, just developing the knight. Here, Magnus plays the move queen to a4, looking to target this knight even further and also defend his pawn, which was being attacked by the knight. Unfortunately, in this position, Victor plays kind of a bad move, and that's the move rook to c8 trying to defend. Unfortunately, this doesn't get the job done because now Magnus can play this move bishop to e6, developing a new pin onto the uh, rook. And now you're getting a lot of problems because now you're going to have an issue where this pawn can move forward and potentially attack this knight. And if that happens, this other knight could potentially be lost. And also realize that after this knight moves out of the way, potentially going to the e5 square, this pawn will be completely undefended. Because of that, Victor now plays the move a6 in order to defend with the bishop and be able to move the knight out of the way. Now we have knight to e4 attacking this bishop and also there is a hidden threat behind this move. If you just simply go back one square, um, let's just say you go to the f6 uh, square, then Magnus will now play this move knight to d6. And now you are forking both of these pieces. And if you try to save your, uh, your bishop and your rook by moving the rook out of the way, this nasty move knight to f7 with a check and you are forking both the king and the queen. You are getting royally forked and you are going to lose this game. So because of that, it's a very tense position and we don't have that move. Instead, we now protect the d6 square by playing the move bishop back to e7. And now Victor is taking care of that threat. Magnus now taking control of the initiative, plays the move d5. Now the knight has to move out of the way. The knight now swings out to the e5 square, knight c to e5. And Magnus now plays the move d6, pushing forward even further into the position. Now, of course, after this move, the bishop reopens up and is looking at this knight. So the queen has to stay protecting the knight. It's very important that this continues because otherwise, if that doesn't happen, then this pawn will be lost because the knight is now defending the pawn. Here we have a bad move, and that is the move bishop to f8. You should not be backing your bishop up. You are putting it in a jail cell from which it will not be able to get out. You should have in this position, uh, Victor should have put his bishop out onto the f6 square if you're going to place it anywhere. 
that would at least make some sort of sense. Unfortunately, we don't have that. We have Bishop going back to the F8 square. And there is one move in this position that gives a plus 2.9 advantage to Magnus. There is only one move, and I'm going to see if you can find it, and it will come back in just a moment. Nicely done, Albert. That's right. We have the move F4. Now, the idea behind this is that you're wanting to target this knight. However, Victor realizing that the only thing defending the knight on the E4 square is the queen now targets it with the move B5. And there's only one move in this position which defends the knight on the E4 square. And that is the move queen to D4. It's a great move and it's because it's the only move. And mainly due to the fact that if you tried to play this move uh, queen to b4, then the rook would come down and fork both the queen and the knight. And then there's no way to defend the knight anymore. So you would end up losing it. Because of this, we now have queen to d4 and knight to c6. Looking to re-attack the queen. As you can see, it was just over there. Um, back over in this position, it was just over on the c6 square. And it goes back to the c6 square. So, so the queen now has to move back again to the e3 square, and we now have the move h6. And in this position, Magnus plays his second brilliant move of the game, and that is sacrificing his knight by playing knight to g5. And this is kind of a pseudo-sacrifice. Um, there's two ideas behind it. First of all, if you simply take, then you get mated on the h-file because the queen targets the king down on the h-file, and this bishop takes away the escape square on the g8 square. So we won't have that. However, if uh, you do nothing, if you play a nothing move, I don't know, like a5, then the knight will come in just like before and fork both the king and the queen and you are getting royally forked. You are going to lose your queen. So because of all of this, the queen, you don't take and you have to move the queen. Now we have queen going to the e8 square, just trying to get out of the way. Unfortunately, we still have a knight f7 check all the same. The king has to move up to the h7 square, and Magnus now just a slight little moving up his queen, ever so slightly, queen e4 check. And the king is in a box. It cannot go back to the h8 uh, square, because if you do, uh, then the knight would simply take, so you can't actually play that move. It's illegal. And of course, if you go to the uh, g8 square, you are looking at all kinds of discovered attacks, potentially with this uh, bishop lined up on the king, and you're going to have a nightmare of a time getting out of the spin cycle. So, because of all of this, we have the move g6. Unfortunately, Magnus now pushes further forward and plays the move f5, continuing to push forward into the position. We now have knight to d8, just trying desperately to get rid of some of the pressure. Look at these poor pieces. They are all stuck behind the 6th rank. They're all on the 7th or 8th rank, and when that is happening, and your king is completely defenseless, you're in for a world of hurt, and Magnus now rips open the position. F takes on g6 with a check. The king now moves out of the way to pretty much the only square that's even fathomably reasonable, and that is to the move g7. And now we have queen to d4 with check. And the best thing in this position is to simply try and sacrifice all of your pieces. Um, but that wouldn't work because, of course, then the queen would simply take. And so now the king takes on the g6 square, goes out in glorious faction with the move queen to g4 with a check. There is only one move in this position, and it will lead to a mate in one. And that is after the move king to h7, the bishop simply slides back. And it's mate. Because... The bishop delivers a check onto the king. The knight takes away this h8 uh, square, and the queen does a wonderful job taking away everything on the g file, and it is, in fact, checkmate. So, realizing that it would be checkmate in one, back here in this position, after delivering the check on the g4 square, uh, Victor Hansen resigns against Magnus Carlsen. So I hope that you enjoyed watching that game of Magnus Carlsen just sacrificing the whole house in order to try to get that victory. And if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games, again, just click on the subscribe button down below. It really helps us out. We're trying to get to that 100 subscriber goal, and you can help us get there. And of course, if you want to see more Magnus Carlsen games right now, you can click on the little playlist which is floating around somewhere up here. 
I hope you enjoyed the game of chess, and I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you in the next video. Take care.